Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you all hear this microphone? First of all, I'd like to say on behalf of the Robbins family uh, how glad we are that these lectures are still continuing 25 years after the first one, and how glad we are that for once in a blue moon we've actually got a British lecturer who is considered worthy to rank alongside the American giants whom you are accustomed to hearing on this occasion. And I can guarantee you that he is a very worthy competitor with them. Now, I first came across the name Adair <clears throat> in a rather different context. When I used to follow North Sea Oil, there was a legendary figure in the American oil industry called Red Adair. Now, he wasn't a communist. He just happened to have red hair. But the great thing about him was he Whenever there was a disaster, a fire, or anything in an offshore oil platform, Red Adair would be the man to send for. He was the troubleshooter who put things right. Uh, unfortunately, he is no longer with us, but we have Adair Turner, who is an even more effective firefighter when it comes to public life and economics. He did a marvelous job on pensions, and he's now, I'm sure, in process of doing a marvelous job to put, put out the, the fire in the financial services offshore wells. So without further ado, I'll ask Adair to give the second lecture, which is entitled Market Efficiency and Rationality, Why Financial Markets Are Different. Christopher, thank you for that uh, introduction, and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in lecture one, for those of you who were here last night, or actually, I suppose, really for those of you who were not here last night, uh, in lecture one, I considered the objectives of economic policy, and in particular, the assumption that the aim and measure of economic success is growth in GDP per capita. And I argued that beyond some level of average income, the correlation between average GDP and human well-being or happiness breaks down, and that the rich developed countries of the world probably reached that point within the last several decades after two centuries of a great transformation in which growth in measured income truly did bring very clear human welfare benefits. As a result, I therefore argued that what I called the instrumental conventional wisdom, the instrumentalist argument, which justified free markets and high inequality because and to the extent that they delivered an increased growth rate, that that instrumentalist argument had become invalid. In this second lecture, I'm, simply, I'm going to turn, however, to the issue of means in economics, uh, methods of achieving ends, and in particular, the role of markets. Let us suppose for now, forgetting uh, lecture one, but let us suppose that increasing GDP were a sensible, desirable, uh, and a objective, a main objective of policy, as indeed I think it still should be in middle and low-income countries. How confident are we that free markets are the way to achieve it? And in particular, how important is financial market liberalization, free financial markets, and what other consequences, good or ill, might free financial markets bring with them? Now, of course, the proposition that markets drive economic efficiency is not only part of economics, it's actually central to much of economics. Uh, Adam Smith illustrated that the invisible hand of the market can drive efficient allocation of resources in a system of division of labor. Friedrich Hayek crucially illustrated the central importance of the price system as an information processing mechanism more powerful than any centrally planned system could ever be. Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Brewer illustrated that complete and perfect markets, if they existed, would deliver what economists call a Pareto efficient equilibrium in which no one person could be made better off without making someone else worse off. They would be as efficient as possible. And the subsequent development of the efficient market hypothesis and the rational expectations hypothesis appeared to some people to prove that financial markets are in actual fact efficient and that the conditions required for rational and stable equilibria apply even in those complex contracts between the present and the future, uh, which is what financial markets provide. 
Now, together, this rising tide of understanding of markets and belief in the efficiency of the markets has provided the intellectual underpinning to the powerful ideology of market liberalization and deregulation, which became dominant in the last few decades of the 20th century. The Washington Consensus, as it was known, in which pretty much all economic activities, from manufacturing to retailing, uh, electrical production to health services could be made more efficient if markets were allowed to operate, and in which, therefore, structural reform to labour markets, free trade, product market liberalisation became key elements of a universally applicable formula for economic growth, and in which free financial markets, free capital flows and financial deepening, a wide array of financial markets and a bigger role for the financial system within the economy, was seen as essential to the efficient allocation of capital. So the political ideology was free market capitalism, but the intellectual underpinning was the concept of market completion. The idea that the more market contracts exist and the more freely, fairly, and transparently we are able to strike those market contracts, the closer we will get to the most efficient possible outcome which is the result most favorable to human welfare. Now, that has been very much the driving idea of much policy for 30 years. And one of the consequences of the financial liberalization and capital flow liberalization that followed was over the last 30, 40 years, a really quite startling increase in the scale of financial activities relative to related real activities. And we can see that along a whole number of dimensions. If we think about the background to the uh, emerging market crash of 1997-98, in the previous 15 years, there had been an extraordinary explosion of capital flows, short-term capital flows, equity and debt, uh, into uh, those markets. And although that crashed in 1998, in fact, over the subsequent 10 years, it soared to even higher levels. Over a longer period, there was a huge increase relative to global GDP in the total level of cross-border uh, capital flows, here including flows in between rich developed countries as well as flows to emerging markets. So you can see these capital flows going from 4% of global GDP in 1980 to about 15% of global GDP in 2005. There was, over the same time period, an amazing explosion of the trading of foreign exchange relative to the real economic variables to which you might believe uh, it related. Uh, what this chart shows on the orange line there is foreign exchange flows growing now to be 20 times bigger than global GDP. So a far more rapid growth in the volume of FX trading activity than in world GDP. Meanwhile, within rich developed countries, what we have seen is dramatic increases in the scale of debt, a key financial instrument relative to GDP. But what is really striking in these figures is that while there has been some increase in the leverage of household sectors and corporate sectors relative to GDP, what is really quite startling over the last 30 years, and it's the purple bit at the bottom of that chart, is the increase in financial sector debt as percent of GDP. And this is debt between one financial institution and another. It is intra-financial system claims. And that, in turn, reflects the explosion of complex trading activities between financial institutions, with, for instance, the emergence of entire markets, which didn't exist 30 years ago, such as interest rate uh, derivative markets. So what we have seen is, in a sense, some people call it a financialization of the global economy, an increasing role of finance relative to the underlying real economic variables, trade, GDP, production, which you'd have thought finance is there to support and necessary to support. Now, partly, some of these increases came directly from the world of floating exchange rates, from the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s and the movement to capital account liberalization and floating exchange rates that followed with it. You end up with, for instance, more 
financial uh, FX trading uh, if there are more people who have to hedge the risk against floating exchange rate risks rather than fixed exchange rate risks. But also, part of this was deliberately fostered by policies of financial liberalization. And indeed, it was the case that as these trends occurred, the increasing scale of the financial system and its apparent increasing sophistication and innovation were seen as positive factors, factors which were bound to create a more efficient uh, economy. The final factor which I think is worth drawing attention to in these overall trends is that as we saw this growth in the size and sophistication of the financial sector, particularly in the last 20 to 30 years, we seem to have seen a very significant increase in remuneration within the financial sector relative to remuneration in the rest of the economy. Now, obviously, that requires you to do an exercise where you're trying to compare like with like. You're trying to have some idea of what is the skill set required here in the financial sector relative to other sectors of the economy that might use the same level of skill set. So it's an exercise that requires a certain uh, a manipulation of figures to try and get it as best as possible, and you can always argue about some of the results. But this study, which is uh, uh, by some people called Philip and, and, and Reshef, which I think is a highly respected study, and which Andy Haldane quoted in the LSE report on the future of finance, what they show is that what they believe is an excess wage a higher level of financial sector wages relative to people of the same skill in the rest of the economy, that this has oscillated through the 20th century and in a very interesting pattern. That it soared in the last two decades of the 20th century, but it also soared in the 1920s, which is also a period, as I will show you later, where the scale of the financial sector grew relative to GDP. And this increase in the scale of the wage of the financial sector has been one of the major elements within the overall increase over the last 20, 30 years in the aggregate degree of inequality within our society, which I discussed in yesterday's lecture and to which I will return in the third lecture. But interestingly, this increase to the dominant conventional wisdom, which I will describe later, did not seem a problem. Because if you believe that the markets are by definition efficient, then by axiom it must be the case that these people are being paid to do useful things which are making the economy more efficient. It is impossible in an efficient market for anybody to be paid more than their marginal productivity. So it must be the case that they are contributing to the economy at least as much and probably a bit more than the pay that they receive. So why are you concerned? Well, we'll come back to that issue later. The crucial issue that these figures then pose, I think, is, given this huge scale of increase in the financial sector, was it actually adding value to the real economy? Was it contributing to growth? And what other impacts uh, might it tend to have had? Now, my focus this evening will be almost entirely on the financial sector and the issues of financial market completion and financial market liberalization. But let me just start by placing it within the context of the wider debate about the role of overall markets. I showed this slide yesterday and talked about how, over the last two centuries, there had been this great transformation, uh, which we are very advanced along, and countries like China, midway through much of Africa, unfortunately, in the very early stage, of a fundamental transformation in the level of income of an economies. Within that, how important were markets? Does the historical record support the intellectual self-confidence of the Washington consensus that the way to get this growth, the way to achieve this transformation, is to have as free a markets as possible? Well, the answer is a bit of a mix. It certainly supports a general preference for some category of market economy. If you look on the left-hand side of this chart, it is undoubtedly true that pure planned economies such as the Soviet Union have ended up being pretty catastrophic failures, or at least they have atrophied. After initial growth spurts, something has gone wrong, and I'll talk about that in Lecture 3. It's also the case that trade access, free trade, has been absolutely crucial to the process of rapid economic catch-up. Almost any country that goes through a process of rapid economic catch-up from behind – 
has done, through, gone, done that by enjoying the ability to trade with the rest of the world. And it is also true that entrepreneurship, the freedom for entrepreneurs and the price system, pretty clearly tends to deliver better restaurants. I mean, if you doubt that, you didn't visit a restaurant in the uh, former Eastern Bloc before the wall came down. Uh, but it also appears to deliver uh, better innovation, for instance, in information technology, despite the fact that, for instance, the Soviet Union had equally high skills in mathematics and pure electronics, but it never turned into the wonderful iPad which Mr. Robert Peston was showing me earlier. However, despite that basic proposition, what is also striking is that many countries in this process of economic growth have um, broken uh, quite systematically many of the rules of the Washington Consensus. The simple fact is that the pre-First World War industrialization of the USA was done behind very high industrial tariff barriers. That is a fact. It is also true that Japan from the 1950s to 70s, Korea from the 1960s and 90s, achieved rapid industrialization with elements of industrial strategy and state encouragement and, again, behind significant uh, tariff barriers. And it is true that China has achieved an amazing breakthrough on the basis of an a e economic model that you would have to describe as eclectic, uh, combining uh, significant elements of competitive intensity with also elements of state direction. So th what the historical record uh, tells us is that there is a general belief that some categories of markets are important, but that our assessment needs to be based on good economic history and one of the things I'm going to say at the end of this lecture is that economic history is something all economists should study, and not all of them do at the moment, on good economic history and open-minded analysis of the complex and varied historical experience, not on an axiomatic assumption derived from mathematics that we know uh, that more complete markets will always deliver better results. But my focus today is financial markets and market liberalization, financial market liberalization in particular, and financial deep link and financial sophistication. Did it, over the last 30 years, drive an increased rate of growth? Did it make our economies more efficient? Well, at the most macro level, there is no clear and general positive proof that it did. Uh, if you read uh, Carmen uh, Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff's book, This Time It's Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly, um, they describe the period, 19, the mid-20th century, sort of 1935 to 75, as a period of relative financial repression, a relatively small role of the financial sector, and I'll show the figures for that later. But actually what's quite striking about that was that those were years of pretty good economic growth in both Europe and the US. A limited role for the financial sector didn't stop the economy growing at some very attractive rates. Now, there are other areas where financial repression probably was a problem. I think there's a very reasonable case, and I'll come back to it later, that financial repression, extreme financial repression, was part of the package of anti-market measures which prevented, for instance, India achieving economic breakthrough before the reforms of the 1990s. But if you look again across the pattern, there were many countries like Korea or Japan uh, which achieved breakthrough without these large complex financial sectors and certainly without the intense trading activities which have developed uh, recently. But to go beyond that sort of very macro picture, we need to get more specific both as to theory and as to some empirics. And that's what I'm going to try and do in this lecture. First of all, talking about efficient and rational markets, and some reasons for disbelief in them. Then a very quick word about the crash of 1997, some more words about the crash of 2008, a word about financialization and income distribution, uh, what is going on, uh, why are some bankers paid quite so much, and finally some conclusions for policy and for the discipline uh, of economics. Let's start with theory. The predominant neoclassical school of economics has perceived or tended to perceive increased financial activity as generally and in most cases positive. And it's believed that because it believes that with more markets, more liquidity, more activity, you complete markets. 
And that goes back to the fundamental uh, propositions of general equilibrium set out uh, by Kenneth Arrow and Gerard de Brewer that a competitive equilibrium is efficient if all markets are complete. And by markets complete, that has to include all insurance markets and all investment markets, as well as the market for uh, food on a day-by-day -day spot basis. And from that, it has tended to follow in the neoclassical uh, paradigm that more liquid stock markets are good things because they enable you to trade and they enable you to express your preference for liquidity, for the ability to go in and out of a market uh, rapidly uh, to a greater extent than before. Commodity futures markets are good because they enable people to hedge risk into the future. Structured credit markets are good because they enable people to select precisely, investors to pre select precisely that mix of risk, return, and liquidity, which most exactly meets their particular investor preferences. Credit derivative markets are good because they enable people most efficiently to hedge risks. All of these forms of uh, a increasing intensification were seen as forms of innovation and increased liquidity, which brought us closer to the sort of arrow de Brewer nirvana where all possible markets exist and are complete, a phrase to which I'm uh, indebted to Jonathan Portes, who very clearly and in a, 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 a very neat article uh, described that process of thinking. Now, within this paradigm, it doesn't mean there's no role for regulation and government, but it tends to push you in a particular direction as to what the role of the regulator or government policy is. Because within this neoclassical paradigm, you can recognize market imperfections. You know that some markets have a lack of transparency, that there are nasty people out there who manipulate and abuse markets, that there can be a lack of liquidity in markets, and that there can be subsidies, taxes, and other interventions which interfere with market efficiency. And you know from Lancaster and Lipsy that if a specific market is imperfect, liberalization of other markets can be suboptimal. That's a classic finding uh, of a, a, a classic article. But what tends to follow from that within the neoclassic paradigm is that what the regulator is about, what government policy is about, is identifying the very specific imperfections which are preventing us from getting to that arrow de Brewer nirvana and putting them right. So what you have to do is increase transparency, punish manipulators, remove uh, restrictive government interventions, make more markets and all markets uh, efficient, and increase liquidity. But what you won't do is ever say that the whole CDS market might be dangerous because you'd be getting in the way of the efficient creation of more complete markets. You would never believe that you should act to dampen market volatility because the market price at any one time is the best expression of the efficient uh, 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 interpretation of all available information. And you certainly wouldn't throw sands in the wheels of speculation uh, through a Tobin tax, a financial transactions tax. Now, these propositions and the strongly free market implications drawn from them, I think have not simply been playing a major role in academic economics over the last several decades, though there have always been dissenting voices present, but they have been uh, uh, somewhat dominant. But I think they've all been even more dominant among policymakers in some of the finance ministries, central banks, and regulators of the developed world. Keynes, of course, famously argued that, uh, quotes, practical men who believe themselves quite exempt from any intellectual influences are normally the slaves of some defunct economist. But I sometimes wonder whether the bigger danger isn't that the reasonably intellectual men and women who play key policy-making roles are often the slaves to a simplified version of the predominant conventional wisdom of the current generation of very much alive uh, economists. And certainly in the case of the UK Financial Services Authority, the idea that greater market liquidity is in almost all cases beneficial that financial innovation was to be encouraged because it was likely to expand investor and issuer choice, and that regulatory interventions have to be specifically justified by reference to the specific market imperfections which they are designed to overcome, those formed key elements in our institutional DNA in the years before the crisis. 
and the predominant tendency of the International Monetary Fund, and I'll quote from it later, both at the time of the Asian crisis and in the run-up to the 2000 to 2009 crisis, was to stress the advantages of free capital flows and financial innovation, making explicit reference to theories of market completion and allocative efficiency. But this benign view of liquid markets has always been strongly challenged by an alternative and, I believe, more convincing school of thought. And that school of thought, of course, goes back to Keynes <laughs> and his argument in the general theory that liquid financial markets do not always ensure allocative efficiency through the attainment of rational competitive equilibria, but are subject to herd effects and psychological <laughs> booms and busts. Keynes, of course, famously described uh, stock market investing, and we always have to remember that Keynes was one of the most successful people at making money out of stock market investing of his time. Uh, he described it as being like those newspaper competitions in which competitors have to pick out the six prettiest faces from 100 photographs, the prize being awarded to the competitor whose choice most nearly corresponds to the average preferences of the competitors as a whole. It is not a case of choosing those which, to the best of one's judgment, are really the prettiest, nor even those which average opinion genuinely thinks the prettiest. We have reached the third degree where we devote our intelligences to anticipating what average opinion expects the average opinion to be. And there are some, I believe, who practice the fourth, fifth, and higher degrees. So Keynes believed and argued very strongly in chapter 12 of uh, the general theory that we had to understand the inherent tendency of any liquid financial market to overshoot equilibrium values and thereby potentially to increase a a misallocations and destabilizations uh, into the economy, that they could produce bubbles and destabilization. And the potential scale of such bubbles and the huge harm that they can cause has been extensively documented throughout history. Uh, first by Charles Mackay in his great book in 1852, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, uh, then by Charles Kindleberger, Manias, Panics and Crashes, more recently by Robert Schiller in, Schiller in Market Volatility and Irrational Exuberance, one of the best timed books of all times. He managed to produce it, produce it at about April 2000, right at the very peak of the internet uh, lunacy. What they have done is set out a history of a whole series of uh, financial bubbles going back to d Dutch tulips and ending in the credit, structured credit and credit derivatives bubbles, and illustrated how each time one of these bubbles develops, somebody is saying this time it's different. Somebody is telling a story of why this isn't a bubble at all, why this is a rational market, uh, why these uh, values are justified by some future set of prospects. But we know that these bubbles occur, and we know that they can cause huge harm to uh, the global economy. So why do markets act in an irrational fashion? Why are they subject to such strong momentum and herd effects? There are three categories of explanation, and I think it's important for us to bring to bear each of these three categories of explanation. The first is that human beings are part rational, but they're part instinctive. Uh, and that is for reasons which is actually rooted in evolutionary biology and what goes on in our brains. In Andy Haldane, in his uh, recent lecture on patients uh, in finance, uh, makes the comment that when making difficult intertemporal decisions, we are quite literally, quite literally, of two minds. And we're of two minds because we have been left by evolution with both a prefrontal cortex, pretty much unique to ourselves and the higher primates, which makes us capable of thoughtful, deliberative, rational assessment, but also with the limbic areas of the brain, which we share with other animals that don't have a prefrontal cortex, which commits us to instinctive and herd-following mechanisms. And we have deeply encoded in us some reasons to go with the herd, the crowd, the tribe, because at various stages in our evolutionary history, if you didn't do that, you didn't survive and you didn't breed and you didn't hand your genes on. 
So we do have to understand what we are as animals. We have to understand, as George Akerlof and Robert Schiller have written in Animal Spirits, that human psychology drives the economy. And the human psychology is of a human part rational, part not, rash, part not rational. So the first important thing to realize is that there is no fully rational homo economicus of the sort that tends to populate some simple versions of mathematical modeling. <laughs> the second set of arguments, however, illustrate that you can end up with irrational collective behavior even if each individual within the process is attempting to act in a rational fashion. Where you have imperfect information and imperfect principal agent relationships, and where you have inherently imperfect knowledge of the future, then it is possible, as Joe Stiglitz has shown, mathematically to illustrate that you are bound to have the possibility of collectively disequilibrium results. And in those situations, it can be quite rational for the individual to participate in a bubble, rationally trying to work out if they can work, jump off the train before it hits the buffers. After all, in Keynes's Pretty Girl competition, those who try to uh, operate at the fourth, fifth, and higher degrees can be perfectly rational people trying to make money out of that process. Individually rational participants can drive a collectively irrational boom. But the third point is that one crucial reason why imperfect knowledge of the future is the only knowledge which is possible is that the future is characterized, the future of social science is characterized by inherent irreducible uncertainty. And inherent irreducible uncertainty is not the same as mathematically modelable risk. And that is a crucial distinction in economic theory, which goes back to Frank Knight's famous article on risk, uncertainty, and profit, and indeed to Keynes's treatise on probability. But it is an insight often ignored not only by economists, but also by practical men. Because the fact is that the management and the trading risk controllers of investment banks used value at risk models as the basis for making bets with huge amounts of money, uh, but with three deficiencies. The basic concept of a value at risk model on the left-hand side of this chart is you observe over some past period, like the last year, the frequency distribution of profits and losses resulting over a defined period, i.e. each daily loss you put into a frequency distribution. You say, well, how many of those could occur over a day, over a 10 days? What has been the pattern of that over the last year? You then work out the 99% confidence level or the 99.9, .9, some level of confidence level of that distribution. And then, hey, presto, you hold capital sufficient to cover some multiple of this value at risk. And that is what the trading centers of the major banks were doing before the crash. And then when the crash occurred, people came and said, well, we've just had over the last three days uh, events which our models tell us uh, could not possibly happen except every 10,000 years. Uh, and in fact, every day we've had an event that only would possibly happen every 10,000 years. Now, the problem was three deficiencies of increasing degrees of uh, fundamentalness. The first is the assumption uh, that the distributions were normal. There was no good reason uh, for assuming that they were Gaussian or normal. Uh, one of the uh, values, the benefits of it, was it made it easier to mathematically manipulate. It made it more computable. But there were fat tails which didn't fit into normal distributions. Still more important was the process of recursive systemic effects, non-independence, pro-cyclicality. The fact that the volatility might tend to go down and down and down because people were observing lower volatility in a way that meant that at the moment it snapped, the day before it snapped, the day of maximum risk, you would have measured the least observable risk. That's pro-cyclicality. But the most fundamental reason why this was a mistake is that the very idea that in social science we can definitively and with absolute certainty derive an objective probability distribution of future outcomes from the observation of past outcomes is actually a philosophical category error since no probability distribution of future outcomes objectively exists. 
And this is where economics, because it is a social science, is different from physics. As Mervyn King and others have written in a recent lecture, there are probably very few genuinely deep and therefore stable parameters or relationships in economics, as distinct from in the physical sciences, where the laws of gravity are as good an approximation to reality one day as the next. Now, of course, at this stage, there's probably someone who says, ah, oh, yes, but even in physics, um, uh, physics isn't really like that because there's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and all that stuff. But the point is that for living day to day, we can work with Newtonian physics. Uh, we can work with the assumption that, that there isn't a categoric uncertainty. Uh, the laws of gravity are a reasonable approximation to reality one day to the next. But it isn't often the same in the social science, where there are deeply reflexive recursive loops, where what is happening is that the reality is being changed by changing behaviors which reflect the changing results of the past. One of the implications of all this is, as you look at those three different uh, reasons, is that unlike in the neoclassical school, when we move to this school of thought, which we might call Keynes-Minsky, after Keynes and Hyman Minsky, it is not characterized by a single unifying theory, but by several, I would say, complementary explanations. But I think that is a strength and a better basis for our understanding of what happened in the crashes of 1997 and 2008 than the newer classical school of equilibrium economics. So now let me turn to the empirics. And first of all, in the interest of time, I'm going to talk very quickly about the crash of 1997. I'm not going to go through my charts. They are in the written version, and you can see the written text. Let me just very quickly tell you what I'm saying about the crash of 1997. Prior to the crash of 1997, one of the things that was going on was a huge increase in cross-border emerging market capital flows, people investing in debt and equity and bank loans to uh, Thailand, to Malaysia, to Korea. And there was an issue in economics as to whether these short-term capital flows, because this is not people investing in long-term direct investment in actual factories, this is portfolio flows, whether these are good or bad for the economy. And the very strong conventional wisdom of the IMF at the time, and of much of the neoclassical school of academics, was that this was undoubtedly a good thing because it was completing markets. And indeed, they were so confident that it was a good thing that actually at the Hong Kong meeting of the IMF in 1997, just as the crash was about to occur, they were on the verge of demanding that short-term capital liberalization, freedom of short-term capital moves in and out, should be made a article, a membership article, uh, required for membership of the IMF in the same way that long-term capital liberalization uh, was an initial founding article uh, going back to uh, the Bretton uh, Woods. But it is the case that if you actually look at the data, and there was a very good report by the uh, Committee for the Global Financial System early last year, when you actually look at whether short-term capital account liberalization does deliver economic benefits, the conclusion is that despite numerous cross-country attempts to analyze the effects of capital account liberalization, there appears to be only limited evidence that supports the notion that liberalization enhances growth. And indeed, there are very fine economists, Danny Roderick, Jagdish Bhagwati, who would go much further than that and say there's no evidence at all, and there is evidence that it causes considerable problems. Problems which arise from what are called bonanzas and sudden stops, in Reinhardt and uh, Rogoff's terms. The process whereby once capital begins to flow into a country, it produces asset price inflation, it produces currency appreciation, which draws in other people attracted by that pr very process of increase in price. And that process complicates monetary policy, <laughs> complicates and misallocates capital, for instance, a lot of misallocation of capital to Thai real estate developments back in 1995 and 96, and when it ends, produces a sudden stop, a rush for the exit, and contagion onto other countries. Now, what is interesting about this debate is that when you go through it and uh, see the response of the neoclassical school to 
what appeared to be a pretty bad setback for the argument that it was beneficial, they come up with an argument which is called conditions and sequencing. Um, that, yes, FX markets overshoot and are volatile, but that is because of poor fiscal and monetary policies and lack of appropriate domestic financial conditions. So if you can, own, if you can only get all the other aspects of policy right, conditions and sequencing, then, then at last, you will be able to have financial market liberalization. And this is a very strong tendency of the, uh, the Washington Contensor School, which is faced with any challenges to its apparent success, it could always find a way of proving to you that the fundamental problem was that its precepts had not been applied to the full extent that they should. This was the approach of Tony Benn in the early 1990s to the success of socialism in the UK. To the extent that socialism in the UK didn't appear to be very successful, this was solely because we hadn't really tried real, real socialism. There is a similar process. What are we to conclude at the end of the day on short-term capital flows and optimal policy? I think it's clear that the theories of irrational markets and the observations of bonanzas and sudden stops give us a much better understanding of the harm that irrational flows can give, can give than does the neoclassical axiom uh, that we know that capital flows are beneficial. Though I would note that I'm not necessarily saying we can do all that much about it. There are no perfect policies to respond to this. And I think one of the insights of economics is we mustn't imagine that to all problems there are solutions. But it does mean that in the area of short-term capital flows, which played such a major role behind the crash of 1997, we at least need to take policy options out of what I call the index of forbidden thoughts. Capital inflow taxes or controls. Of course, done by Malaysia in 1998, attacked by the IMF as having done a terrible thing against the canons of financial orthodoxy, uh, but actually Malaysia pulled through the crisis just as well as those who took the IMF orthodoxy. Being applied today, of course, by countries like Brazil, who have a problem of short-term capital flows uh, pushing their, a, their currency up to undesirable levels, or indeed financial transaction taxes. But let me turn in more detail to the crash of 2008. The crash of 2008 followed, as I showed earlier, huge increases over the last 30 years in the scale of financial activity relative to real GDP. Increases in balance sheets relative to GDP, increase in capital flows between developed countries relative to GDP, increases in foreign exchange trading relative to GDP, but also very specifically over the last 10 to 15 years, an explosion in financial sophistication, in financial innovation, with all sorts of things which had never previously existed springing into existence. So we had the explosion in the growth of credit uh, derivatives. We had the explosion in the growth of asset-backed securities, though you'll notice it was an explosion followed by a bit of a collapse. Similarly, in global credit derivatives, and similarly in complicated structured credit, what are called collateralized debt obligations, uh, and even synthetic collateralized debt obligations, which for those of you who don't know what they are, what they enable you to do is structure and splice up a credit into a set of tranches, even though that credit never existed in the first place, as an actual liability of a real corporate, but is simply on the other side has somebody else who is synthetically willing to pretend that they are that corporate so that you are, as it were, taking positive and negative positions against the credit of a corporate who's somewhere else in the room but has nothing directly to do with you. And of course, the great thing is, it's rather like the fourth and fifth degrees, we can do not only CDOs, we can do CDO squares and the CDO cubes. Now, that was what was occurring. And until the crisis broke, what was intriguing is that this growth of liquidity, complexity, and financial intensity was perceived not only as not a problem or as a risk, but as very explicitly a positive development. These are the words taken from the IMF Global Financial Stability Review of April 2006. 
The IMF GFSR is a review that you should read in order to understand what the risks are in the financial system in order that we can guard against them. And what the review said in that year was, first of all, on the right, it made a statement about efficiency. It said credit derivatives enhance the transparency of the market's collective view of credit risks and thus provide valuable information about broad credit conditions and increasingly set the marginal, oh, marginal price, not the marginal rice, the marginal price of credit. Therefore, such activity improves market discipline. Now, what that is saying is that when you are going to provide credit as a bank to a corporate, the great value of credit derivatives is that they provide a market price which tells you what is the correct price for you to charge. So the pr marginal price of credit is increasingly set by the market's collective view. And that should, in this uh, hypothesis of efficient markets, produce more efficiency because we are achieving a process of price discovery, a crucial world in this uh, uh, neoclassical belief, price discovery which will help efficiency. Meanwhile, however, on the right-hand side, it was believed that we were getting all these benefits with efficiency alongside stability. And here are the truly uh, stunning words. There is a growing recognition that the dispersion of credit risk by banks to a broader and more diverse group of investors has helped make the banking and overall financial system more resilient. The improved resilience may be seen in fewer bank failures and more consistent credit provision. Now, somewhere in the bowels of the IMF, the poor person who wrote that has been sort of locked up and not allowed out uh, for some time. But why were they saying this? Well, at the core of this is very explicitly, and it really is quite explicit, the concept of market completion. This is a statement which derives from an intellectual point of view. These are practical men who are the slaves of a very specific set of uh, economists. And the assumption behind it is that market efficiency and market completion provide something which will provide efficiency and stability. But clearly something went badly wrong. And what essentially went badly wrong is that this theory only works if the market's collective view is a wise view. But let's see what the market's collective view of the stability of the banking system was immediately before the crisis. What this shows is, on this line here, the CDS, the credit uh, derivative uh, swaps, a, 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 a credit default swap prices for major banks a, up until over the last... Uh, between 2002 and then up to the crisis. And the green line is the share price. And this line really is the really interesting one. This, after all, is the market's collective view of risk. And what it is telling us is that in about June 2007, the risk in the financial system had reached a historically low point. It had never been as low as that. So looking at the market's collective view of risk, you knew that the whole financial system was less risky than it had ever been, right on the verge of the biggest financial crisis that we have had for the last 70 years. CDS prices, the market's collective view, the market's collective wisdom, provided us with no warning whatsoever of the problems we were about to hit, nor did the equity prices of banks. Rather, the equity prices of banks required, provided strong reinforcement to the belief of bank management that they were doing absolutely right things. So the stability argument broke down because the market is not always wise. But alongside that now obvious point, it's also important to question whether the supposed benefits of increased financial in intensity were ever actually achieved. The argument, let us remember, was that we would get increased stability, clearly not but also improved allocative efficiency. And improved allocative efficiency has fundamentally, from this extra intensity, has fundamentally been argued either by axiom, it must be true because market completion is a good thing, or by a sort of general extrapolation from the fact that, as it were, America's a richer place than the Soviet Union was. Markets are, in general, better than planned economies. Therefore, even more markets and even more markets and even more markets must be better than just a few more markets. 
But on the other side, it's important to realize two things, that instability itself can generate misallocation. The instability of huge amounts of credit, for instance, put into unnecessary commercial real estate development, or back in 2000, the overinvestment in some quite unnecessary uh, websites which have uh, uh, disappeared without trace. Some of that doesn't matter. Some of that is simply what's called Schumpeterian creative destruction. We'll probably never get innovation without some of that. But the other point is that even where there might be allocative efficiency benefits, there must be, there must be some declining marginal benefit from yet more intense and intense liquidity and price discovery. Professor Benjamin Friedman, in an article in the FT last August, noted the development of algorithmic trading in stock exchanges. Now, what algorithmic trading in stock exchanges enables you to do, literally, with a powerful computer, is to buy a stock and then to sell it in a fraction of a second. And indeed, you can do this several times a second. You can buy, sell several times in a second. And if you ask the true devotees of market completion what the value of this is, they will say that it is providing more liquidity and aiding price discovery. I think it is simply an obvious point that there must be some diminishing marginal a a benefit. That once we have got to the level of stock markets that provide reasonable hour-by-hour hour liquidity for somebody to buy and sell, or even minute-by-minute minute liquidity, it cannot be the case that there is some huge social benefit of then progressing on and on and on to the ability to buy and sell in a fraction of a second. So, my overall conclusion, therefore, is that beyond some point, financial intensity and in some areas, and it does vary by uh, different areas of the financial system, beyond some point, financial intensity may bring with it the downside of instability, and that beyond some point, the allocative efficiency benefits are at best unproven and probably highly likely to be subject to diminishing marginal return. I'll come back later to the implications of that for optimal policy, but turn now to consider the other interesting consequence of increased financial intensity, which is the growth of uh, the pattern of uh, the, the growth of high remuneration and high returns in the financial uh, sector to the issues of financialization and income distribution. Now, financial activity enters into GDP. It enters into GDP both as an end consumer product, which individuals buy, and also as an intermediate product, which enters the production functions of corporates. And it ends up through the complicated processes by which we count GDP in that wonderful figure, GDP per capita. And I'll return tomorrow to the fact that actually, although we quote these figures of GDP per capita, they're subject to a great deal more arbitrary conventions than we often imagine. Actually, a point which Lionel Robbins made at great and very uh, perceptive uh, not at great length, uh, uh, but, but very strongly and very perceptively in his essay on the nature and significance of economic science. But even within the difficulties of constructing a measure of GDP, financial activities are peculiarly difficult to work out how we should count them. And that is why in Andy Haldane's chapter within the LSE Future of Finance report, it is called, What is the Contribution of the Financial Sector? miracle or mirage. But let us for now assume that we do know how to run some figures and that they mean something. What is interesting is a long-term increase in the size of the financial sector relative to GDP. Uh, this line here is a financial sector gross value added. This line here is total sector uh, gross uh, value added. And you'll notice something interesting about it, that between the mid-19th century and the First World War, the financial sector outstripped the real economy. Then there was a lengthy period of about 50 years where it roughly keeps track with it. Then there is a last 25 years where it has grown significantly faster. Now, there is a good reason that I'll come back to for reason that this period of increased financial intensity may have been a necessary part of the growth-creating process. But it is also quite noticeable that this period in which there was no outperformance of the financial sector relative to the non-financial sector uh, was also a period of fairly rapid and successful growth. 
We get a similar pattern when we look at the US figures. Again, uh, these figures from uh, Andy Haldane's a, a chapter in the Future of Finance report. What this shows is a dramatic increase in the share of the financial industry in US GDP. But again, note that significant fall after the 1929 crash. And again, note that period of the post-war era where it was much lower than today, but still supporting a vibrant capitalist uh, economy. So we've seen a very significant increase in the size of the financial sector. And we have also seen, as I showed earlier, what appears to be a very significant increase in the relative wage of people in the financial sector relative to similar skills or apparently similar skills in other sectors of the economy. We have also, as uh, Andy Haldane shows in his chapter, seen an increase in the return on equity in finance, though notice that this increase comes with a significant increase also in the volatility of that return. The mean of the return on equity has increased, uh, but so has the standard deviation. So there has been higher return and higher risk. So why did this increase in financial sector factor incomes occur? Well, in the neoclassical paradigm, the dominant ideology of a, uh, a free market liberalization, uh, the answer is obvious, and is obvious by axiom. It must be the case that this increase in real factor incomes must have derived from an increase in the real value of the, the real value added functions performed within more complex and more global economies. Um, because couldn't have been anything else, because that's what efficient market theory uh, tells us. But there are at least four possible other explanations, which I think we need to bring to bear. First, there is something about financial services, not unique to financial services, but significant in financial services, both retail and some bits of wholesale financial services, which is com purely conducive to opacity of margins, not clear what the margin is, and to asymmetries of knowledge and power between the provider and the consumer. That is, for instance, a problem in retail buying of pension products. It's why you end up with some people for their pensions uh, paying uh, asset management and distribution fees so large that by the time they get to retirement, 50% of their more of their pension pot has turned, has been taken away in sets of a commission, etc. So that's factor one. The second factor is that there's something about financial products that makes them peculiarly susceptible to complex, opaque put options. One of the great things that people sold, they still sell them, but in the years before the crisis they were selling them in large quantities, was structured products. And these structured products gave what is the holy grail of investment return, which is this wonderful thing called alpha. Uh, alpha is higher return without higher risk. Actually, we're not meant to be able to get that, and it's pretty difficult to get, but it gave you this. Somebody would come along and said, you're putting your money safely in the bank at 4% per annum. I've got this thing which will give you 4.5% per annum, and there's no extra risk. In almost all cases, the reason why it looked as if there wasn't risk is that the risks were hidden. They were of the cl classic category of put options or extreme events. These were things which would look good for 19 years out of 20, but in the 20th year, year, they'd look horrible, but by that time, uh, your producer was long gone and wasn't liable in any case. And there are a lot of these things, both in the wholesale markets and retail markets. Third, tax and regulatory arbitrage. I talked yesterday, in Roger Bootle's terms, of activities within the economy which are purely distributive rather than creative. And sadly, there are quite a lot of these in the financial sector. Let's take tax, arbitrage, and structured products. Creative, in the words of some investment bank activities, is often applied to the structuring of products, which undoubtedly require high mathematical or legal or logical skills, but where these products essentially don't change any fundamental economic reality, they simply change the tax or the regulatory treatment of that reality. And when that occurs, that is a classic example of what Roger Bootle means by that phrase distributive, because all that is really happening is a distribution of money is occurring from the generality of taxpayers to the specific beneficiaries of that structured tax product. Finally, 
There is an ability within the financial sector, which Paul Woolley uh, here at the LSE has, I think, very effectively identified, for the financial sector, not, I think, as an act of sort of smoke-filled roomed conspiracy, but through a collective process to create through its trading activity volatility against which the non-financial sector then has to pay it in order to hedge the risks created by volatility. What is the balance between real value added and some of these drivers of distributive rents? I don't know. But I think it is important for us to realize that the potential for distributive rents is considerably greater in the financial sector than in many other sectors of the economy where there is a much greater ability for consumers really to work out what product they are being sold and what its inherent value is. But that still leaves the question, why so much of this value sticks to the individuals themselves rather than to the shareholders? Uh, because it could stick to either. And you'd have thought in an efficient labor market, uh, it would end up with the, uh, the shareholders because the, uh, the, 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 the labor market would be paid only just that amount required to stop them going off to some other category uh, of activity. And it is the labor market returns which are striking. As, as Andy Haldane has pointed out, the shareholders have got higher returns, but with higher risk. It is the increase of an investment bank and hedge fund and trading remuneration, which really only the last 25 years has become the activity of choice for highly skilled people who want to get rich, um, in a way that it wasn't 25 or 30 years ago, and which has now become a significant social concern because it is a major driver of the inequality I referred to yesterday. Now, of course, in the conventional wisdom again, there cannot possibly be a problem because this highly skilled labor must be producing a high marginal product and in an efficient market, it cannot be the case that it will be receiving a wage higher than the social value delivered. Under some circumstances, the wage might equal the full marginal social product. In others, there will be a surplus, but it cannot possibly be higher if efficient markets a, apply. But the problem with that is uh, twofold on the right-hand side. First, that where we have a mix of some indirectly creative, and they are indirectly created, and some purely distributive rent-extracting activities, it is possible for private marginal product to diverge from and indeed be higher than social. Second, I think one of the crucial things we need to understand, which I referred to yesterday, is that what people get paid in society depends not just on the actual or apparent marginal product, but on the apparent measurability of that marginal product. When you are a research scientist contributing to the development of some new intellectual idea, some drug, some new piece of engineering, it is incredibly difficult to work out what your contribution to the total was, it's incredibly difficult to work it out year by year. But when you are a financial trader, it appears to be possible to work out at the end of the year exactly what your contribution is. And I think for us to understand the determinations of high-skilled income, we have to understand that apparent measurability is a clear and important driver as well as whatever we believe the underlying private or social product is. Thus, I believe that the higher the share of complex financial services in our economy, the greater is the risk that highly skilled people will be attracted to highly paid activities whose impact is primarily distributive rather than socially value creative. And that in doing so, it makes a major contribution to the phenomenon of increasing inequality, which are inequality, which I referred to in lecture one. So what conclusions follow from all this for the discipline of economics um, and, indeed, for policy. Well, that's the subject that I'm going to spend most of Lecture 3 doing, where I'm going to try and talk about the implications for policy and the discipline of economics, both of the stuff that I talked about yesterday, about happiness and the objectives of economics, and today's material about markets. But just some quick ideas to end up with. What are some possible conclusions? First of all, all imperfect markets are different. Many of you probably know the opening line of Tolstoy's Anna Karenin. All happy families are happy in the same way. All unhappy families are unhappy in their own particular way. 
Paul Krugman, sadly not myself, but Paul Krugman, turned that into a neat uh, aphorism, which is that all perfect markets are perfect in exactly the same way, and all imperfect markets are imperfect in their own particular way. Perfect markets only exist in our economists' models. Imperfect markets are what exist in the real world. But imperfect markets come in a very wide range. There are some markets which are imperfect, but they're close enough to the way we describe perfect markets as operating that it's a reasonable basis for public policy to operate as if we should just rely on the markets. Broadly speaking, if we want a good supply of restaurants which have nice ambiance, nice menu, new ideas, and good service, there is no better way to do it than to let entrepreneurial animal spirits flourish, let a thousand flowers bloom, some will flower, some will wilt, and we'll end up with better restaurants than in Soviet Russia. But that then is a spectrum of markets, and financial markets are at a fairly extreme end of that spectrum, where simply allowing them to flourish can create problems created by these inherent imperfections and failures and irrationalities which can exist. Second, the benefits of financial market liberalization differ by stage of development. There is a very good case, and I document some of the evidence in, my, uh, in the, the text of the lecture, for believing that some degree of financial deepening and increased financial sophistication is a necessary part of the early and middle stages of the economic development process. Walter Badgett in Lombard Street argued that the development of the British banking system was one among the factors which enabled Britain to achieve a first industrial revolution ahead of, for instance, France, and there is a reasonable case for that. From where India is at the moment, the extension of basic banking services and indeed of things like private equity and basic good equity research into the Indian economy can be part of what helps India achieve progress from its present level of GDP per capita. But beyond a certain level, it becomes simply unclear whether more and more intense financial deepening and innovation truly is adding uh, great value. Mortgages are great innovations. ATMs are great innovations. Paul Volcker has questioned whether there has been any great financial innovation since those were brought in. I don't know whether I go quite as far as that, but we do ask to, need to add some searching questions. Which brings us to an interesting paradox. I said yesterday that in the early stages of the transformation, the great transformation of income, increasing income and contentment are aligned. Increasing GDP per capita matters a lot to increasing happiness in Africa and China, and much less so in the UK or the US. But it is also the case that financial market liberalization from where they are at the moment has a positive role to play in helping the growth rate of Africa or China, but much less from where we are today at helping our growth rate, and perhaps not at all, in rich developed countries. From which it also follows, and I'll come back to this tomorrow, as a general point, stability matters a lot. Minor increments of allocative efficiency matter relatively little. If you had to trade off the danger that complex financial instruments that none of us quite understand were going to create a nasty recession like we currently face, even if you did believe that that would be that they were going to deliver a slightly higher positive growth rate, and even if you believed that over time the slightly higher positive growth rate would outweigh the sheer numeric reduction in GDP, you'd still probably vote against it. Because people care much more about setbacks to already accrued income and wealth than they do minor increments of benefit, additional growth in the future. So stability matters a lot. Minor increments of allocative efficiency matter little. So even if we did believe that there is a major allocative efficiency or a significant allocative efficiency benefit in financial sophistication, our regulatory policy should still have a very strong bias towards stability. Finally, economics for the real world. Four implications for economics. 
The first is that it needs to deal with human beings as they are, human beings which have a prefrontal cortex and a limbic system of the brain. Robert Lucas, one of the doyens of the rational expectation hypothesis and highly mathematical neoclassical uh, approaches, has used these words. I prefer to use the term theory as something that can be put on a computer and run, which therefore helps the construction of a mechanical artificial world populated by interacting robots, which economics typically studies. I think the difficulty is that if we study interacting robots, we are not studying the real world. We do need to study people as they have been described by Danny Kahneman, by Bob Schiller, by George Akerlof, and that means that part of our economics has to get into things to do with neuroscience and psychology and descriptive economics as well as good mathematics. And let me be clear, people like George Ekeloff can run the mathematics as well as anybody else, but they get into this descriptive economics as well. The third is that, uh, second point is that we need to look at markets as they actually operate, not assume them to be efficient and rational, but observe how they actually work in practice. That means that we need to understand how people process information, what is the role of the flows of information, all that stuff on Bloomberg, how do people respond uh, to stories and ideas, again, something which George Akerlof and uh, Robert Schiller have written uh, very well about. But it also means, therefore, economic history must be a key input to economics, that economic students should read Charles Mackay and Charles Kindleberger and the history of the crash of 1929 alongside good formal economics. Finally, it means that good economics is going to be about uh, multiple understandings, no simple models, or no all-encompassing models. Good economics should not attempt to arrive at any all-encompassing model or theory, because the real world isn't like that. Should we understand the instability of the financial markets in terms of human behavior and brains which are part emotional and part rational? Or should we understand it in terms of imperfect knowledge economics, information asymmetry so deep that financial markets would be unstable even if populated by Lucas's robots? Or should we understand it in terms of Frank Knightian inherent irreducible uncertainty? The answer is all three. Real world good economics cannot be monolithic. But we have to recognize that that will put it at a disadvantage in the competition for ideas. Because many people are drawn to all-encompassing intellectual systems, which are elegant in their basic theoretical structure and which appear to provide clear and consistent answers to all policy questions. That is why when Jagdish Bhagwati was trying to understand why, contrary to the evidence, there was so much attachment to the idea of capital flow liberalization, he said that ideology matters as well as interests, that people are trapped by all enveloping idea system. And it's why, in Keynes's words, practical men are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. But we need to fight against the law of complete systems. We need to accept and communicate the fact that while good economics can help us understand the world, mitigate specific risks, and think through appropriate responses to continually changing social and economic problems, good economics is never going to provide the certain, simple, and complete answers which the pre-crisis conventional wisdoms claimed it had provided the answers to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adair. You've made it clear that you're by no means a defunct economist. In fact, I predict that you have a long life ahead of you as an economist, rewriting all the textbooks and the courses at the LSE. None of them, of course, will go into banking because the salaries will, will be much too low after you've done your best. Uh, I think we could sum up that lecture in the, the very simple example you've given of the restaurant. Even if you eat in a wonderful restaurant, beware, you may get food poisoning. Uh, anyway, we now have a few minutes for questions, so there's one at the back there. You've got the roving mic. <coughs> we got a, a microphone there, please. 
Um, as, an, as an economics grad student, I'd really like to believe that um, economists come up with uh, things they believe are good, and politicians then adopt that and follow it. But uh, it seems more to me that they only do that if it fits their agenda. So why do you think did the uh, complete markets paradigm become so dominant? Well, that's an interesting point, and it's one I'm going to uh, address tomorrow. Uh, and the question I'm going to ask at that stage is, okay, is economics really in any sense to blame? Uh, so uh, Robert Skidelsky, who I think is coming uh, tomorrow, has said uh, we need to reconstruct economics, and various other people said economics was to blame. There is an alternative argument which people put forward. It says, look, economics never was monolithic. I mean, look at who won the Nobel Prizes. I mean, you know, it, it, it included Danny Kahneman, it included Joe Stiglitz. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's lots of articles available which, you know, pointed out the uh, information uh, asymmetries and imperfections. Uh, all these ideas are there. And there's nothing wrong with mathematical economics. Some of the mathematical economics proves the very facts uh, that I suggested. So surely the argument then becomes it must be the fault of the way that, you know, idiot politicians misused economics uh, don't blame uh, the academic discipline. I do, however, think that it's the case that there were some tendencies within the predominant strain of the academic discipline which made it easy for there to be an alliance of what Jagdish Bhagwati calls ideology and interests. I think the mathematization of economics, which really you know, took off in the middle of the 20th century, although very valuable in giving it a precision and a, the ability to say some very complex things, unless it is combined with continually searching tendencies, it, it, searching determination to ask questions about what the end objectives are and about how human beings really operate, can push you down the direction of saying, well, let me populate my models with homo economicus because that makes the models work. And it's damn difficult if I don't do that. So what I will argue tomorrow is that you can't abs entirely absolve a dominant strain of economics from what occurred, that there were some tendencies within the way that economics was uh, taught, the way that it was mathematized, the way that economic history and some wider disciplines tended to get squeezed out, which made it more likely that we would have this migration of the always, you know, multiple insights of economics into this simple uh, ideology of you pick up Arrow de Brew. And of course, let's take Arrow de Brew. I mean, Kenneth Arrow devoted in a huge amount of his professional career to pointing out all the ways in which the perfect markets of the general equilibrium theory did not possibly exist and could not possibly exist. So right at the start of that, you've got a, a, a professional economist who himself was pointing out the dangers of it. But it is an interesting question, and it's one I'll try and address tomorrow afternoon. Is this a fault within economics or a fault of how economics was used? You mentioned Nobel Prize winners just now, and I was reminded of today's news that Chris Pissarides of the LSE yep. has been given a Nobel Prize and I gather it's for imperfections, work on imperfections in the labor market. It's just it the kind indeed. of thing you were talking about. Oh, we have a question, of two questions here suddenly, the lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, I'm struck by how profound the implications of some of this are for the regulation of the financial sector. I mean, if we don't think there have been any sort of significantly beneficial uh, financial innovation since the mortgage or the ATM, um, what should we be doing about all the sort of behaviours and products and activities that have grown up over the past decade? I mean, you mentioned, for example, the financial transaction taxes, but it feels to me alongside that there's the potential for quite a lot of intervention in financial markets. I don't mean to put you on the spot, um, but well, where's your thinking on this? Well, the answer is I don't think you can. I think it's very difficult to walk in and say, I know how to distinguish socially useful and socially useless. And I don't think you can ask a regulator precisely to do that. And actually, probably more than uh, Paul Volcker, you know, I could argue that credit derivatives appropriately used can, under some circumstances, be uh, you know, valuable. I'm not quite in the sort of uh, 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 Warren Buffett, you know, these are weapons of mass financial destruction 
point of view or the George Soros point of view. Um, but I think we allowed them to get out of hand because if you are going to have innovative financial markets continually trying to discover and create new things and themselves not interested in whether the impact is distributive or creative because individuals don't do that. They'll just be interested and make it money. The crucial thing is to have a is to have regulators who are continually focusing on how much capital is required against these activities, whether the risk controls are, are adequate, uh, whether they are sold reasonably to uh, non-financial buyers. And I think, uh, I think in all, all sorts of ways, we fell down, and the, the regulatory community across the world fell down. And it fell down partly because it was itself susceptible to this argument that everything must be fine because the, 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 the free market uh, was doing it. And it really was the case that when people said, well, we're a bit worried about the risk in this market, so we think we'd like to slap on a higher capital requirement, the argument would come back, well, that is going to limit li liquidity in this market. And th that was sort of the worst thing you could do. You were sort of, oh my God, I'm going to limit liquidity. I must be an evil person, so I won't do it. Um, and I think simply shifting that attitude round can make a very significant difference. I mean, the other point is I did within it say some of this increased financial intensity you know, is a, a, a necessary function of a world of floating exchange rates. I mean, part of that growth of foreign exchange trading will automatically occur in an environment where, where uh, a exchange rates are fluctuating rather than exchange rates fixed and where there is more... Uh, global trade than there was before. I think it is very difficult to be precise about it, but the crucial thing is we need a much more robust attitude, uh, both in relation in the US rather than here, to specific bits of lobbying. I mean, some of the deregulations done in the late 1990s in the US were the direct result of lobbying with campaign finance behind them. Some of it was the result of an intellectual system which was too simplistically believed. Bhagavati's ideology and interests acting together. Right, question there. Uh, you mentioned uh, distributive and non Sorry, creative. can you speak up? Yeah, can you speak uh, up? Oh, pre press uh, on the mic. You mentioned uh, uh, financial services that were distributive you you and not creative. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you, you talked about different ser financial services that were distributive and not creative. But w we have a few, like, a few uh, resources such as the uh, transportation that are distributive and can't really be described as, as creative a lot of time. How, how would you, uh, like? Well, when you say distributive, of transportation. Yeah, like you put people. Like I want to go to a restaurant, so I hop in a taxi and I. <laughs> Well, uh, well, no, I, th I think it's that's not part of the definition structure here. Uh, the distinction which I made yesterday, I don't know whether you're here yesterday, but uh, it's, it's described in yesterday's lecture, and it's, uh, the, the phraseology I have taken is, is from Roger Bootle's uh, latest book of a distinction in an economy between a distributive activity and a, a creative activity. I mean, the easiest way to think of a distributive activity is a poker game. You know, you and I sit down and play poker, one of us will win, one of us will lose. At the end of the day, one of us is poorer, one of us is richer, uh, but we don't think that the economy has got uh, uh, bigger. Uh, yeah. A creative activity, I mean, presumably the activity of a doctor helping make somebody well, uh, you know, correctly identifying, that is clearly creative. Mm -hmm. It creates high, uh, you know, an improvement in human welfare. The intriguing thing which Roger points out, and I think it's absolutely right, is that our economies are shot through with mixes of distributive and a, 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 a creative activities. Um, the example I gave yesterday is you know, divorce lawyers. I mean, uh, you know, they're fundamentally distributive. I mean, if, if, we, if we doubled the number of divorce lawyers, uh, we wouldn't actually think we'd got a better society. We'd simply just have more people involved in these distributive fights as to who gets what uh, in divorce. Uh, but the fact is that the activities of divorce lawyers counts in GDP. And the hypothesis that a uh, Roger has is that there's something about rich, developed economies where there is a greater part of economic activity which might take the form of these distributive rather than creative activities. That's, that's the distinction that's going there. Transportation, I think, you know, I, I think taking me from A to B if I want to go there, that seems to me a pretty clear form of a creative uh, 
uh, activity. Um, uh, very, very important, and it's a point I made yesterday, the complete red herring in all of this debate is between uh, material products and services. And actually, it's a point which way back in 1932, Lionel Robbins made uh, in his uh, essay. He said, look, there's a debate about whether um, what is the relationship between real income and you know, contentment, utility, can we use these concepts? But the one thing which is just irrelevant to that debate is material products versus services. A restaurant meal is as likely or unlikely, or we can debate it either way, as likely to make me happy as a new washing machine. Right? There's nothing about material goods, and transportation is a service. I think we just have time one for one more the, question. One chap up there. I was just worried you might yeah, well, miss somebody. Well, there oh, there's four, four over there. All right. Oh, God, six. Oh, God. Just, okay, fine. We'll just take that one. Just take the one I'm pointing to. Is he at the back? The one I'm pointing to. No, there. No, no, uh, chap at the back. Yep. Sorry, sorry about the others who come back tomorrow. Yep. You can ask that um, knowing what we know now, why was it... Why would it be a bad idea if the um, banks misbehaved again to let them fail? And secondly, isn't it uh, um, acceptable now to have a, a Robin Hood tax, given that it would be very, uh, the impact would be very minor on the economy? Well, it's not acceptable that banks fail and impose losses on the taxpayer. Um, the biggest losses that they impose, by the way, are not the overt fiscal costs of rescue. Um, when you look at the total fiscal costs of rescue, plus the costs of central bank support, it's quite possible that they'll end up negative costs at the end of the day. Often when you put in equity stakes, you sell them eventually at a profit. When central banks lend money on emergency or regular liquidity, they pretty much always make money because they charge penalty rates for it. Uh, guarantee, treasury guarantees will not be called. It may be that the government will make a profit on that, but the economy won't because the process of these things failure has, of these banks failing, has imposed an enormous shock to the credit supply system, which has put the economy into recession and created a, a burden of debt for the future. And we need to put a, a, a halt to that problem in the future. And one of the ways is to make sure that debt providers to banks, subordinated debt and senior debt, know that there are circumstances in which they will suffer loss or be converted to equity. The challenge in regulatory design is to design processes whereby we can do that but still keep the fundamental machine of lending to the real economy, which is an important machine, uh, going. And one of the great challenges that we have with large financial institutions is that we can't use the classic processes of bankruptcy. Because when we use the classic processes of bankruptcy, uh, we create fire sale conditions, uh, we create a loss of the, the ongoing machine, and we create uncertainty shocks through the system. So there's a lot of work going on at the moment, and indeed I'll be flying off to Seoul next week for the meeting of the Financial Stability Board ahead of the G20, precisely focused on the too-big-to-fail problem and how we create smooth mechanisms which will enable us to impose losses on debt holders uh, in uh, large, systemically important firms, but do so in ways that does not end up shocking the economy. Because the problem we faced back in October 2008 was we were between a rock and a hard place. If we had put them into classic insolvency procedures, we would have put the economy into a worse mess than it was. After all, that's what we did in 1929. We know what happens when we put banks into classic insolvency procedures. We've got to create smoother processes uh, for the future. The Robin Hood tax, the financial transaction tax. I mean, there are big issues about is it achievable within one country, within Europe versus others, uh, exactly how it would operate, to which areas could you apply, and other people are uh, working on that, and if at the end of the day it isn't practical, I could be convinced it isn't practical. All I have been determined to do is move it out of what I call the index of forbidden thought, because there was a tendency several years ago to say, what a terrible idea, because it will get in the way of liquidity. It will get in the way of price discovery. And one of the things we do have to be willing to in these debates is stop treating 
sort of uh, price discovery and liquidity as words that make us sort of quake at the knees and immediately give up pragmatic arguments about what optimal policies are. Well, thank you very much for a most stimulating lecture. <laughs> I just remind you the third lecture is tomorrow at 6.30. And it's on economic freedom and public policy, economics as a moral discipline. So do all come back and bring a friend.